Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Tonight we're talking about botulism, deadly to horses, and it's sponsored by Neogen, the makers of Botvax. Botulism is highly fatal, it's multi-species, it's a neurologic disease caused by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum and the toxin it produces. The CDC classifies it as a category A agent because it's a food safety concern for humans and poses a real risk for as a bioterrorism weapon for use against humans and animals. Despite their large size, horses are the most susceptible species to botulism toxicity, making them an important piece of understanding the botulism puzzle. That also means our horses are at risk for death from botulism. So how do you protect your horses from an invisible threat that has no smell? To answer that question, we're joined tonight by Dr. Daniela Ludi of the University of Pennsylvania's uh, Veterinary Medicine, College of Veterinary Medicine's New Bolton Center. Welcome, Dr. Ludi. Hi, thank you. So, Dr. Ludi, we were just talking about how frequently you see botulism cases. Can you tell our audience a little bit about your experience there at UPenn and um, with botulism and then also your interest in internal medicine? Sure. So, um, I'm a board certified internist, meaning I specialize in large animal internal medicine. So. I've been at the University of Pennsylvania for four years. Um, we've seen a lot of botulism cases here, both of, both because of the area that we're in, as well as um, the sort of high density of horses in this area. So I've treated botulism in a variety of horses, mules, donkeys, um, bulls, kind of, kind of all slew of different sorts of uh, equids during my time here. Okay. I wanna give everyone a quick review of the Ask the Horse a live format before we get started. We'll begin with the questions that everyone submitted during registration, but if you're listening live, you can go ahead and ask a question or ask for a clarification on one of the doctor's responses in the chat window if you're listening online, um, and that should be in front of you. We're gonna do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, our first question is from Peg in Florida, and she said that she found a flattened dead mouse in her hay once. Could this cause botulism? So not necessarily. Uh, botulism is everywhere. The bacteria that causes botulism is really everywhere in the soil. And just finding a dead mouse in your hay doesn't necessarily mean that the toxin is being produced. So for the bacteria to produce the toxin, there needs to be sort of the perfect environment for the bacteria to produce the toxin. And that's usually a, a wet environment with low oxygen and a high pH. And um, just sort of finding a dead mouse in your sort of hay that looks okay otherwise usually isn't too big of a risk. Okay. So if someone does find a dead animal in their hay, should they continue to feed from that hay or should they discard that uh, to be on the safe side? Usually to be on the safe side, I would, I would discard at least a bit of hay that was associated with the dead mouse. Um, you know, unfortunately, you can't say for sure that it's not there. So just to be on the safe side, I, I would probably discard that bit of hay. Okay. We have a question from Lorna in Tennessee, and she wants to know what types of horses are most likely to be at risk for botulism? So horses and humans are the two mammals that are actually the most sensitive to botulism. So um, a really small amount of the toxin can cause disease. And so in horses, there's no particular breed that's more likely to get botulism, but foals are of particular concern if their mares haven't been vaccinated because foals can get botulism through sort of a different route um, than the sort of typical forage-based botulism that adult horses can get. And so if foals aren't vaccinated, that, that can be a big concern, but there's no other real specific breed or anything like that, that's more at risk for botulism. Yeah, so I know in foals, it's usually called a sh shaker syndrome. Can, can you explain to us a little bit about why it gets that specific name when we're talking about the babies? So the shaker foals are, are called the shaker foal syndrome. Um, because the foals are weak, so they have fasciculations or tremors of their muscles, and that's that's why they sort of shake and, and get that name. Okay. 
So we have a question from Susan in California, and she wants to know how long, if a dead mouse was in a water bucket, would it take for it to produce botulism? So again, similar to similar to the dead mouse in the hay, it, it really won't necessarily cause botulism. Um, again, it needs to be sort of that perfect environment to, to allow for production of the toxin. So just a dead mouse in the water bucket is unlikely to cause botulism. I would just um, throw away that water. Okay. So Craig in New Mexico wants to know if the bacterium that causes botulism is anaerobic. Yes, it is. So it's uh, what we call an anaerobic bacteria, which means that it thrives in environments that have little oxygen. Okay. We have Mary Lou in Wisconsin, and she says that she breaks apart her hay prior to feeding and walks the pasture occasionally. But could botulism still be in the soil and at, are her horses at risk? Yes, unfortunately, potentially they could be at risk. The, the botulism bacteria live everywhere in the soil, basically almost everywhere in the world. Um, and so the bacteria itself, again, doesn't pose a risk unless there's a sort of a friendly environment for that bacteria to germinate or the spores to release their toxin. So, um, you know, really just depends on whether or not the, the bacteria has that perfect environment or not. But the, the bacteria itself in the soil may or may not pose a risk. And Anne uh, submitted her question via email and she wants to know what the botulism toxin looks like. What should should you be looking for? Unfortunately, the, the toxin is quite small, so you can't see it with the, the blind eye at all. Um, so there's really, unfortunately, no, no signs to look for. You can't find the toxin in your hay just by looking at it. And we have Rosemary in the UK, and she wants to know if botulism is more likely to be found in hay or haylage. And so as you answer this question, can you explain to us what haylage is? Yeah, so haylage is um, sort of partially wilted hay. So uh, some people also call it grass silage. So basically the hay is taken before it's completely dried out in the field, it's put in to a plastic bag. Um, so sometimes if you're driving down the road, you see a field and it's got those, those big, um, you know, round structures of sort of white plastic. Um, that's, that's often haylage. Um, and by wrapping the, the plastic around the hay, it removes the air, which reduces the, the oxygen within the bag. Um, and then the hay kind of ferments and it lowers the pH within the, the bag to, to ferment and make it a little bit more easily storable. Um, but the problem is if the bag is punctured, the, the pH within the, the bag can be higher. And then again, it's sort of moist in there. And then that is the perfect environment for the botulism bacteria to produce the toxin that causes the botulism disease. So haylage and um, you know, sort of grass silage is potentially more risky than, than your sort of standard hay. We have a question from Kimberly in Arkansas, and she wants to know if feeding from round bales of hay is a bigger threat than feeding from your regular uh, small square bales. So it's similar to the previous question. Um, if the if, if it's just your standard square bales of hay um, that are the sort of classic hay, that is certainly less risk than than the round bales or the hay silage that that has that sort of perfect environment for the bacteria to produce the toxin. Okay. So is there anything that the hay producers can do when they're putting up their hay to reduce the risk of of botulism? It really, it comes down to making sure that the, the fermentation process that you're striving for with the haylage is is done appropriately so that the, the plastic bag isn't punctured, um, that the pH within the bag stays low because the bacteria doesn't like to grow and doesn't like to produce the toxin at low pHs. So that's, that's sort of the best way to prevent the, the haylage to allow production of the toxin. We have a question from Steve in our live audience, and he wants to know if a horse survives botulism, what's the prognosis for a full recovery? If a horse 
survive botulism, they're, they usually go on and do quite well um, as far as a full recovery. However, it usually takes um, quite a long time for them to regain full function and, and rebuild their strength because the, the toxin um, attacks the, the nerve endings and, and those nerve end endings are no longer functional. So basically the body has to regrow nerve endings and that takes weeks to months for it to happen. Uh, so we talked about the full clinical signs a little bit, but what would we be seeing in an adult horse that has botulism? Mm -hmm. So the, the clinical signs are, are dose dependent. So um, they vary depending on how much toxin the, the horse was exposed to. Um, some of the earliest signs that we see in, in adult horses are, are the horse just being a little bit quieter, a little bit lethargic. Um, again, muscle weakness can be one of the, the sort of first signs. So again, some you know fine tremors of their of their muscles, especially in their uh, front legs. Um, tongue weakness can be another one. So if you if you pull a horse's tongue out of his mouth and he just leaves it there, that's kind of one of the sort of earliest and most consistent signs. And then as as we sort of progress, um, horses can become dysphagic, meaning they're unable able to eat so they might try to eat or try to drink and the food might fall out of their mouth or out of their nose and again in the fold one of the sort of earliest signs we sometimes see is, is milk actually coming from the nose of the folds. For the clinical signs, the neurologic clinical signs, how what other diseases might be confused for botulism? Like it, when you have a horse come into the clinic, is botulism your first thought or are there other things that you're looking for? It very often is because in, in our area, we have really good uh, field veterinarians who, who can pick up the signs fairly early, um, you know, especially a horse that isn't able to eat. eat uh, quite weak, really botulism is the, the top of our list in, in this area. But a lot of times the, the signs of botulism can be a little bit confusing. So some people will sometimes confuse the horses and, and think that they're actually colicking. So one of the, the most common things that people confuse it with is actually colic. Okay. Um, our next question is from Gina in Wisconsin, and she wants to know if there are certain areas or states that have have a higher prevalence of socialism? Yes, so um, certain areas certainly have a, a higher prevalence of botulism. So uh, our area here, so Pennsylvania, the mid-Atlantic region, um, Kentucky has a, a fairly high prevalence, Ohio, Maryland, um, and Tennessee are, are some of the areas that see the, the highest prevalence of botulism. And, and there is some variability in the, in the types of botulism that you can see. So the, the most common type is the type B botulism, which is what we see in, in this area, um, versus there is, there is a type A, which is more commonly seen in, in the Western United States, so California, Oregon, um, that part of the country. Are there any areas that are considered safe from the, the disease, or could it be anywhere just not as prevalent? No, again, it, it can be anywhere, so it's fairly ubiquitous in the environment around the world, so there's there really know one area that is safe, but certainly the prevalence appears to be higher in, in certain parts of this country than others. Okay. We have a question from Bobby in Mississippi, and Bobby wants to know how botulism uh, can get into a wound, and also is it possible for a horse to carry botulism and not succumb to it? Yes, so uh, botulism, again, the bacteria lives in the soil and, and horses are quite dirty. So um, certainly horses are covered in, in soil or, or dirt fairly frequently. So the, the toxin can um, basically, uh, the, the bacteria can end up in, in a wound or a, a cut in the leg or, or anywhere on the body. And then again, if there's just a nice little wet, moist environment for the bacteria to, to grow, then they can produce the toxin. And that's how we get what we call wound botulism. Um, horses can, uh, there, there's no 
carrier state of botulism in horses. So if horses are exposed to the toxin and they're not vaccinated, well, then they will get sick um, and then either recover or, or succumb to the disease. But um, there is no, horses don't carry the, the botulism bacteria or, or the toxin, so they can't spread it from horse to horse. We have a follow-up question from our live audience about the regions where botulism is present. Uh, Laureen wants to know what makes one area of the moon to bottom over other areas? So certain areas just seem to have a, a higher incidence or prevalence of the bacteria in the soil. So um, for some, you know, whatever reason, you know, Pennsylvania, it's a nice moist area. So again, there's more of the bacteria in this area. So that certainly sort of predisposes. And then as far as the, the clinical cases that we see, um, a lot of it can be related to the, the population of horses and, and whether or not they're vaccinated. So again, in this area, we, we see um, a lot of uh, botulism cases because there's you know certainly a, a subset of horses in this area that are not vaccinated and they're therefore more predisposed to getting the, the disease. So the vaccine isn't uh, a core vaccine that all horses get. Um, how do you know if you live in an area that your, your horse should be getting botulism vaccine? Yeah, but the best thing to would be to work with your you know farm veterinarian and and get their recommendations on, on what vaccines your horse needs so for example my personal horse and when I lived in California he was not vaccinated because um, we did not see a high incidence in that area and then when I moved over here um, I did vaccinate him sort of in consultation with veterinarians in this area so the best thing that do is to work with your local veterinarian in your area and they'll know exactly what vaccines your horse should be getting or not we have a question from our live audience. Callie wants to know if the soil can be tested to see how much botulism is uh, possibly present. It can, and that's how we know that the, the bacteria is everywhere. Um, the, the better thing to do is to test um, for the toxin rather than the bacteria. So again, the bacteria themselves aren't necessarily a problem, but the toxin is what causes the disease. So um, in outbreaks, we often recommend that the, the food, um, the, you know, the hay, anything like that is, is tested for the toxin. And, and so there is a, a test to do that. Um, and that test is, is what we call a PCR. So it tests for the DNA that makes the toxin. And who would you contact about having that test done on your farm? Our veterinarian would probably be, again, the best person to talk about that. Um, the, the lab that runs the, the test for the toxin is, is at the University of Pennsylvania. So there's the University of Pennsylvania Botulism Lab, um, and they're the ones who actually run the test. But as far as submitting it, probably the best way to go about that is to speak with your veterinarian and go from there. Okay. We have a question from our live audience. Brenda wants to know if there's any way to treat, dress, or bandage a wound to prevent botulism infection? No, so the, the most common botulism that we see is not associated with wounds, so it, it's fairly rare that we see what we call wound botulism, so botulism associated with a wound. Um, by wrapping a wound, you, you are potentially making a, what we call an anaerobic environment, so a low oxygen environment, and that is favorable for the, the toxin production. So um, there's no particular way to, to wrap a wound to make it less likely to lead to botulism. But again, most botulism cases are, are not wound botulism. They're, they're feed-based. So they're, the horse is ingesting the toxin in, in whatever feed they're being given. Okay. Uh, from our live audience, Steve wants to know if there's an antitoxin and how effective antitoxin might be in treating a horse or preventing botulism. Yeah, so the, the antitoxin, there is an antitoxin. The, the way the antitoxin works is it, it binds the circulating toxin within the horse, so it can't reverse the effects that the toxin has already done, um, but it can hopefully sort of stop progression. 
Um, it's, it's very effective. However, it really depends on, on how severely affected the horse is already. So what we tend to say is, is you know, when the research supports this, is horses that are unable to stand because they have botulism them, those horses are, are the ones that are unfortunately unlikely to recover. But if you can give the antitoxin to a horse when it's showing some of the early signs of botulism, um, it is quite effective. Jennifer, in our live audience, wants to know if botulism is more prevalent after hurricanes or flooding when waters could possibly be contaminated. Um, and if so, are there any precautions that you could take to protect your horse in those situations? The, the potential there is if there's um, wetting of, of the feed. So if any hay that's been stored has, has become wet, then again, that might set up a nice uh, uh, environment for the toxin and, and for botulism to, to take a hold. Um, but just the, the, you know, wetting the soil itself shouldn't be an issue. Uh, Jillian in Nova Scotia, Canada asked, what strange of, strains of botulism affect horses and are there vaccinations for all of the strains and how effective are they? There are a couple different strains of botulism. So they're, we call them types. So type A and B are the most common ones that we see in the U.S. And if you remember from earlier, I said type B was the most common in, in the um, mid-Atlantic region, and type A is more common in the western United States. Um, occasionally, we also see type C uh, and type D botulism. The vaccine covers type C botulism, which is the most common type of botulism that we see in the United States. Um, but there is not a vaccine for the other types, but they are, are much less common. Okay. We have a question from Patricia in Ontario, Canada, and she wants to know if it's true that it's safe to feed haylage to your horses if you've been vaccinating them for botulism. So horses that are uh, vaccinated for botulism are, this kind of goes back to the previous question, they're, they're protected for um, the type B botulism. Um, but if, if you were unlucky and you had the type A or type C or type B botulism in, in the haylage, then that certainly could lead to botulism in a horse that's already vaccinated. Um, if the haylage is, is stored and fermented appropriately, then, then it is certainly safe to, to feed to a horse that's vaccinated for botulism. But if you, if you had haylage that was spoiled, uh, I certainly wouldn't feed it to a horse, that, even if it was vaccinated. Okay. Brenda in our live audience wants to know what preventative measures an owner should take if they are feeding round bales. Is vaccinating enough? Are you looking through the hay? Do they need to be cleaning up? leftover hay, what, what suggestions do you have uh, as their vet? So vaccination is number one. Um, horses, if you're in an endemic area, an area that sees a lot of botulism, then they need to be vaccinated. Um, other than that, making sure that the, that the haylage uh, is properly stored, fermented, um, important and then you know going through it in the sense that if you if you notice that it that it smells you know inappropriate or it's it's wet or moldy anything like that then I then I certainly would not feed it. Okay. Kay in our live audience wants to know what the recommendations are for the vaccine. If you never vaccinated for botulism before is there a booster series and then once you start vaccination how frequently do you need to do that? There is. So if a horse is getting vaccinated for the first time, it's a series of three vaccines. So they receive the first vaccine um, and then three to four weeks later, they receive a second vaccine. And then three to four weeks later, they receive a third vaccine. After the three dose series, then they are fully protected. And then they just need one shot um, once a year to keep them protected. Um, I have seen cases of botulism in horses that did not receive the full series or horses that were overdue for their shots. So it's really important to make sure they get that full three dose series and it's important to make sure that you stay on top of it that they get it every year. Okay. 
Rita in our live audience wants to know if you live in a place where botulism is rare, but your vet suspects that one of your horses may have contracted it through the soil, should you go ahead and vaccinate the other horses living on the property? That's often our recommendation. So again, it, it sort of depends if you, if you knew that, that the horse that got sick had the type A botulism, then, then maybe it wouldn't make as much sense, but oftentimes we don't know that. So in general, our recommendation is if you, if you have an outbreak of botulism on the farm and the other horses are not vaccinated, we do recommend going ahead and starting to vaccinate them. Um, and there is sort of an accelerated program that you can do where you give the, the shots a little bit more um, close together to get them sort of fully vaccinated a little bit sooner. Catherine in Kentucky wants to know about vaccinating foals. At what point should you vaccinate your foal? How young is too young or how old is old enough? And what is the recommendation for the broodmare prior to foaling to help protect that, that baby once it's born? Yeah. So the, the AAP, uh, which is the American Association of Equine Practitioners, uh, publishes guidelines for vaccination. So um, that's sort of the recommendations that I tend to follow. Um, ideally, pregnant mares should be vaccinated for botulism. And I, I believe that the AAP recommends that they get vaccinated at their eighth, ninth, um, and tenth months of gestation. Uh, so during their pregnancy at the eighth, ninth, and tenth months of their pregnancy. Um, and then those foals are protected for two to three months. Um, foals should then get vaccinated with the three dose series starting at about two to three months of age. And then again, they get the second and third dose uh, four weeks apart. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the passive transfer of immunity from the foal or from the mare to the foal. Um, how does that take place? Are these babies when they're born um, more susceptible to botulism in, in their initial days uh, until they get the colostrum? Yeah, so it's really important that foals get colostrum from their mare because that's really how they get their um, immunity for the first a uh, couple months of their life. So um, unlike people, the, the placentation in the mare is a little bit different. So foals don't get any immunity while they're in utero or, or in the mare. So they get all of their immunity from the mare um, when they drink the colostrum. Um, the colostrum, again, if the mare is vaccinated for botulism, should give the foal antibodies against botulism. Um, and then foals are protected by the, the what we call the maternal antibodies, so the antibodies from the mare um, for about two to three months, at which point sort of as they as they start aging, the foals start building up their own immunity and their own immune cells and their own antibodies, um, which is that's the point that then we start vaccinating them. So that sort of two to three months period is when we when we say, okay, the foals are starting to build up their own immunity, which is why that's when we start vaccinating them. Okay. Um, we have a question from our live audience from Molly. Molly, um, actually, Molly was asking about the the protocol for uh, for mares and brood mares. Um, we have Ashley, and Ashley wants to know if there are any side effects to the vaccine. There are no specific side effects to the botulism vaccine. Um, it's similar to any other vaccine, uh, similar to in people. Some people have, um, you know, small reactions to some vaccines where they'll have a little bit of a fever, um, a little bit of a sore muscle, and, and, you know, that's something we see in, in a really small subset of horses, but it's not any woman with the botulism vaccine than any other vaccine. Um, we have a question from Sheila, and Sheila wants to know how long for sure is the vaccination effective? If she doesn't get to it yearly, is there an extended protection that might be more than a year? Unfortunately, I don't know that we know enough about it to say that for certain. Um, again, I have seen horses that had botulism um, that were just a little bit late on their vaccines. So, um, you know, if you're a month or two late, 
you're probably okay. But if you're, you know, if you're pushing it much beyond that, I would start worrying that you, you start losing some immunity and, and it, that's very horse dependent. So um, everyone's immune system is a little bit different. And, and that means every uh, response to the vaccine and, and how long it lasts is different. It's a very individual what about our older horses? I know when we start uh, not taking them off the property quite as frequently, uh, some people might get a little bit more lax about their vaccination schedules. Are those horses, because they are older, are they more susceptible to botulism or are they less susceptible because they've been vaccinated throughout their lifetimes? They are neither more or less susceptible. They're, they're equally susceptible. So, um, you know, it really, again, um, if you're in an endemic area where a lot of botulism is seen and, and your veterinarian recommends uh, the botulism vaccine, then staying on top of it for your older horses uh, is, is certainly important. Uh, older horses might be more likely to succumb to the actual disease in the sense that um, they might suffer more complications if they if they are down for a lot, long time. They can get pneumonia, and, and those are things that could be, you know, a, a bigger concern in an older horse that whose immune system is already maybe not up to speed because he's getting older. We have a question from Elise in our live audience, and she wants to know if botulism is prevalent in your area if you've had a horse that has had botulism is there a danger to humans to also get botulism on that property not necessarily um it, it's it's not that common for adult humans to to get botulism so actually botulism is the the same bacteria that makes the, the botulism toxin is, is actually what Botox is. So when people get Botox, that's actually the bo and the tox is short for botulism toxin. Um, in people, the, the sort of most common uh, ways that we see botulism is actually infant botulism. So that's, you know, human babies that were fed honey that was, uh, again, sort of in, improperly stored um, or improperly stored sort of canned foods. But just, just having a, a horse on the property that had botulism doesn't mean that the humans are at risk. Okay. Kelly in our live audience wants to know if the vaccine should be given separate from when you're vaccinating for against other diseases. Um, so should you vaccinate at the same time or should you separate this one out from your core vaccines? That's very dependent on on your horse and, and your personal uh, feelings on, on vaccination. Um, you know, some, some people argue that you shouldn't give all the vaccines at once because you want to sort of let the, the horse build immunity to one at a time. Um, but you know, at the same time, plenty of people give horses all their vaccines at once and then they build immunity appropriately. Uh, if you have a horse that tends to be really sensitive about vaccines, so if you have a horse that tends to get uh, fever after getting a vaccine, that horse that I might spread out the vaccines a little bit more versus, uh, you know, a horse that, that tolerates it just fine. I think you're probably fine to give all the vaccines at once. We have a question from Audra in our live audience, and she wants to know if mowing your pasture grass as part of your maintenance plan can help keep, uh, create a lower risk for botulism. No, unfortunately not, but what you shouldn't do is you should and uh, that would grass up and let it ferment and then feed that to a horse because that potentially could, if you're not doing it right, uh, could be a nice little harbor for, for the bacteria to produce the toxin and that could actually lead to botulism. Yeah, so I have known um, in my time with horses, a horse that died because a well-meaning neighbor mowed their yard and then took the grass from the, the bag and, and dumped it over the fence line without the horse owner knowing um, is that death could that result for, um, from botulism from that kind of situation um, with that horse I think we always thought it was colic from from eating that fermented grass I think probably more likely it's that that horse colic after eating some fermented grass unless that horse started to show signs of weakness it gradually got more weak and um, you know and, and nothing like a true 
botulism case, but I, I think if it died fairly quickly, then it was probably more likely to be just that, unfortunately, um, you know, it caused pretty severely related to the, the fermented grass. Yeah. So what recommendations do you have for uh, horse owners who do have those well-meaning neighbors that that want to throw the grass over? How how can we educate <laughs> our non-horse owning neighbors uh, that that while it seems like maybe a nice thing, it it could threaten our horses' lives? Yeah, I think you you sort of struck on it by saying educating them. I think you have to have open conversations with the well-meaning uh, neighbors and, and explain to them that um, although it seems nice uh, to feed the horse the the, the grass clippings, that you know it certainly poses a risk from a number of reasons, and um, you know it might be nicer for them to maybe just feed the horse a carrot or something. Um, we see similar things with goats. You know, well well-meaning neighbors try to try to feed the goats some. Uh, you know, different plants, and then it turns out those plants end up being toxic to the goats. So um, I think really educating your neighbors about, you know, not feeding your horses strange things is probably the best way to go. Uh, Holly and our live audience wants to know what the survival rate is if botulism is caught in the first 24 hours of clinical signs. So the survival rate, there, there's been studies to look at the sort of overall survival rate of, of horses with botulism, and, and those studies fit with what we see clinically. So if a horse is able to stand, so if a horse that has botulism is able to stay standing, the survival rate is, is quite good. It's, you know, somewhere close to 90, 95%. Um, but once the horse is unable to stand, their their prognosis is much worse. So it's you know 50% survival if they're not able to stand. So can you walk us through what it would be like as a horse owner to bring your horse in, say that they're showing some neurologic signs that you're not so sure about, you think they're colicking, uh, we bring them into the emergency clinic. What can I expect? from that visit? How, how will the diagnosis and treatment progress during our time at the hospital? Yes. So it's unfortunately a really scary thing for an owner to have to bring a horse into the hospital. That's, that's never, never a good thing, unfortunately. Um, I'll, I'll give you sort of two scenarios. So one with the horse standing and, and one with the horse down. Um, so if, if you, you know, suspect that your horse has botulism and your vet came out and saw the horse on the farm and, and they're worried that, that, that he or she has botulism and they send them into the hospital, basically what would happen is we would put the horse in a, in a stall. We usually try to put them in a, in a nice quiet stall, a, a padded stall, so they have some sort of cushioning if they do want to lay down. Um, we usually put an IV catheter into them and then we, we move fairly quickly because we're trying to get the, the antitoxin into them as quickly as possible because again, um, you know, it binds the circulating toxin. So you want to get that, that circulating toxin within the horse bound as, as quickly as possible so that you can try to minimize how, how severely affected they get. And then at that point, it, it's really just kind of depends on, on what the horse does. So in the initial period, we, we try to keep the horse nice and quiet. We try to let the horse, um, you know, rest if it wants to, but if, if he wants to lay down, that's okay. If he wants to stand up, that's okay. Um, and then it's a matter of supportive care. So oftentimes we, we end up putting them on some IV fluids for a little bit. We end up uh, tubing them with, with nutrition to, to sort of keep them hydrated and keep their nutrition up. And then, you know, depends again on how severely affected they are, but they're usually in the hospital for um, at least a couple of days to a couple of weeks um, versus a, a horse that's coming in that's that's unable to stand. Um, those horses we end up putting on, on a sled system and we actually, you know, sled them into the stall. Um, same thing, we put an IV catheter into them, we give them the antitoxin. Um, some of those horses we end up having to put into a sling to sort of help pick them up because, again, horses are quite big. We don't want them to be down for too long. Um, and then it's the same supportive care thing. So um, nutrition and, and IV fluids and, and that sort of thing. And if a horse is down, again, their their chance of survival is, is lower. Um, and 
if they do survive, you're looking at a, a longer period of time that they're going to be in the hospital. And so once the the horse is un, in treatment, what are the signs that it is going to recover versus it's a, a failed recovery? Yeah, if, if a horse is unable to stand, then that, that quickly becomes uh, a big concern. The, the other thing that can happen is if, if they continue to progress in their signs, the, the toxin causes paralysis. So it, basically the toxin doesn't allow release of a neurotransmitter that allows your muscles to, to do their basic functions. So movement, um, standing, anything like that. But the, the other thing that it can do is it can affect your respiratory muscles. So um, it can affect the horse's ability ability to breathe. Um, and if the horse gets to that point where it's unable to breathe, then um, because it's unable to move its chest to expand its lungs, then, then that quickly becomes um, a big concern. Um, in foals, we, we certainly have foals that are unable to breathe and we end up putting them on ventilators. But in, in adult horses, that um, you know it, that's quite expensive and most people choose not to do it. Um, as far as things that, that make us, you know, start to feel hopeful is, is if a horse stays standing, um, you know, a, a horse that slowly starts to get stronger. And, and I, I emphasize slowly because it, it does take a long time because, again, those nerves have to sort of, they have to grow new nerves, basically. Um, and that takes time. Um, but over time, as, as the horse stays standing, it starts to get stronger. And then probably, you know, one of the earliest signs that we'll see is a horse that was unable to eat is now able to eat then that that's a really encouraging sign okay and so once a foal goes on the ventilator what is the likelihood that that foal is is going to recover so foals have a much higher survival rate than than adult horses so um foals you know adults again the survival rate is about 50 percent if they're unable to stand um, versus, you know, 90, 90, 95% if they are able to stand. Foals, the overall survival is, is close to 95, 100% if they, regardless of if they stand or, or are unable to stand. Um, so the, the sort of survival related to botulism and foals is, is higher. Um, a, a foal that is on the ventilator helping it breathe, uh, you know, they're usually going to be on the ventilator for you know between a couple of days to you know a week maybe two weeks on the ventilator um and so really the the biggest thing that affects prognosis at that point is unfortunately finances so you know it, it is expensive to keep a full on a ventilator and, and some people you know obviously a lot of people i, I certainly couldn't um afford it um and that ends up being the, the sort of big determining thing but um, foals have a much higher survival rate with botulism than adults, and a lot of that's just related to the fact that they're smaller and, and being down for a long time isn't as detrimental. Okay. So because it is expensive for that critical care, are there things that owners can do for intensive care at home? Is it possible to manage a case during recovery at home? Definitely. If a if a horse ends up to the point that he or she is able to eat, then you know even if it's a horse that ends up spending more time down, that's certainly something that you know an owner can manage at home. Um, if you had a horse that you know had some early signs of botulism, it doesn't necessarily need to come into the hospital. Your your local vet, if they can get the antitoxin, can give the antitoxin on the farm to the horse, and then you know hopefully sort of stop progression of the disease, and then it, and then you can try to manage it on the farm. We have our question a question from our live audience. It's from Bobby, and Bobby wants to know if if wound botulism is preventable with the vaccine. Um, I, I and it depends on the, the type of botulism. So if it's the, the type B botulism, um, the vaccine protects against that. And so that is, um, so then that certainly would protect um, against the wound botulism. If, you know, if you're in the Western United States and uh, let's say the wound botulism was type A, then, then the vaccine would not protect against it. But again, the, the wound botulism is the, the least common of all the botulisms we see. 
We have a question from Rita in our live audience. And she wants to know if you've ever seen a horse contract botulism through a spider insect bite, or is it always from an actual deep puncture wound? I have never seen um, a horse contract botulism from a spider or insect bite. Um, yeah, as far as the wounds, um, you know, the wounds tend to, again, they need to be that perfect environment for the, the bacteria to grow. So they, they do tend to be bigger, um, nastier wounds. We have a question from our live audience. Ashley wants to know if you can elaborate more about the differences between types A, B, and C, and how a horse might uh, contract those. And do they all present the same clinical signs? Yeah, the, the clinical signs can be uh, basically the same for the, the different types. Um, the, the types are a little bit different as far as both the, the geography. So, again, the type B is the most common in the mid-Atlantic area in Kentucky versus the type A is, is the most common on the West Coast. Um, the type A and B uh, botulism tends to be soil origin, so the bacteria live in the soil, um, versus the type C and D tends to be um, we see that more commonly with uh, contamination of the food with, you know, uh, animal carcasses. So uh, dead rabbit in the in the hay that then fermented inappropriately. Uh, Doug in our live audience wants to know if a horse is showing neurological signs, should he as an owner press his vet to test for botulism right away? No, the test for botulism takes a long time. And so the majority of times the, the diagnosis of botulism is a, is a clinical or presumptive diagnosis based on uh, the, the clinical signs that we see in the horse. So there's, there's very few things that cause this sort of weakness and um, dysphagia or inability to eat in horses. So um, really, if, if you um, were suspecting botulism and your vet came out and suspected botulism, uh, you should treat the horse with the antitoxin and the supportive care, and you shouldn't wait for the results of, of any testing because the results, um, you know, the fastest turnaround is about a week, and at that point, you know, you don't want to wait a week to, to treat your horse. Yeah. Uh, Kay in our live audience has a follow-up question. She'd like to know more about the cost of treatment and recovery. Do you have a ballpark of, of what the average cost is to, to get a horse through? Uh, a botulism case? It really depends on how severely affected they are. Um, the antitoxin itself costs about $800, $900 for the antitoxin. Um, most horses that come into the hospital at uh, UPenn um, with botulism, if they're, if they're fairly mildly affected, I, we often say uh, you know, if they're going to be in the hospital for about a week, uh, between three and, and six thousand um, dollars. If a horse were down initially, but then you know it begins to be able to stand. Um, you know, if a horse needed sling support, so it needed to be picked up with a sling, I think you're looking at closer to um, probably somewhere around ten thousand um, dollars. But that's very you know dependent on. Um, the hospital in your area, um, and, and sort of how severely affected both the horses. Uh -huh. and, and do you know the cost of, of vaccination for it? I don't have a price off the top of my head, but I'm, I, I would guess the vaccine is probably $25. It's, okay. it's fairly inexpensive. So it's certainly more cost effective to vaccinate your horse if you're in a endemic area. Than, than to treat for botulism. Uh, Allison in our live audience wants to know if feeding compressed alfalfa bales make a horse more likely to contract botulism. Is there a risk from compressed bales? Uh, I'm not familiar with compressed bales. Is she talking about some of the like hydration hay products? Yeah, no. So compressed bales are actually, there's something that we have quite a bit uh, out here on on the west coast, um, so they 
they are super compressed. So you take a bale that's 70 pounds that would normally be probably five or six feet long and it gets compressed down to about two feet um, wide. And so they're really highly compacted flakes of hay um, and a lot of, a lot of compression. Um, I know personally I've, I've fed compressed bales and I don't know that I've noticed any differences. I think that they're they're probably cured the same as any other mm -hmm. quality produced hay, but I, I'm not sure. Um, so that might be a question that we need to follow up uh, with um, someone who uh, is in an area with alfalfa bales. Um, but we have another question from Paula, uh, who's listening live, and she wants to know if feeding horses off the ground would help protect them from botulism? Are they more likely to get it if they're eating their hay directly off the dirt? No, they're not any more likely to get it if they're eating directly off the dirt versus um, elevated. Uh, you know, I would say if you're in an area, and this is unrelated to botulism, but if you're in, in an area with really sandy soil, uh, feeding on a, a mat or um, elevated is probably helpful. So the horse is ingesting sand, they don't get sand colic, but um, there's, there's no uh, advantage from the botulism standpoint of feeding on the ground versus elevated. Okay. Uh, Ashley in our live audience wants to know if the different types of botulism A, B, or C, if the antitoxin is different for those or if the treatment is different. The antitoxin covers uh, A, B, and C. So it covers a couple of the different types, which are, you know, the most common types. So again, B is the most common and then A and then C. So the, the antitoxin covers for, for all three of those. Okay. Um, we have a question here, um, a follow-up from Allison. She wants to know if a horse uh, has recovered. You've, they've, they had a severe case, but they have been treated. You've done that $10,000 worth of intensive hospital care. What is the likelihood if they are um, a sport horse that they're going to return to their same level of activity? And then how long is that recovery period before they might be competing at the same level they were before they got sick? The recovery is probably going to be months. So the horses that I have treated that have been, you know, high-end sport horses, jumpers, hunters, that sort of thing, um, and, and those horses that have recovered, it has been, you know, months, I would say, at least six months before they're back to their, their full athletic ability. Again, that's just related to the time that it takes for the, the nerves to regrow, and it, and it takes you know, time for them to build their strength back up. So imagine that you lost all of your ability to move, use your muscles for a period of time, then um, it's going to take a long time for you to kind of get your fitness back. So um, it, it will take a long time. So for the horses that are sport horses or performance horses that you've treated, once they you treat them as an internal medicine specialist. Is there a point where then they get turned over to a sports medicine vet to help with that recovery to get them back to work? Uh, I know with neurologic stuff, it can go internal medicine, but also there's a, a sports medicine component if, if they're a performance horse. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely, we have sort of a team approach to a lot of our cases. So if we, you know, got a horse through the sort of critical time where they're, um, have recovered from the worst of the botulism, but they're still sort of weak. We, you know, definitely working with the sports medicine clinicians, and um, you can work with rehabilitation uh, veterinarians or specialists, and and sort of help with uh, different exercises that you can do to help them sort of strengthen up and and you know regain their function. That's that's definitely an option. Brenda in our live audience wants to know if placing a round bale in a hay hut to help discourage uh, the perfect environment for the bacteria to grow could help protect our horses? Uh, again, not necessarily. The the round bale that, that caused botulism, it's, it's probably the center of the round bale, which is the, the you know, wettest, um, sort of happiest part for the, the bacteria to live and produce the toxin. So putting it in a, in a little hay hut um, you know, probably isn't going to change the environment within the actual round bale. Okay. 
I have a question from Dana in our live audience, and she wants to know if a horse uh, is castrated on her farm on the ground, can that horse get botulism in the castration incision? That would be quite unlikely and, and quite uh, unlucky. Um, that certainly isn't the common type of botulism. And I've certainly never seen a case like that. Um, certainly, could you get wound botulism like that if it got sort of secondarily infected? Then, then potentially, but I have never seen a case of that. We have a question from Claire in our live audience, and she'd like to know if horses are more at risk for getting botulism during a drought, particularly if you're sourcing hay from a, a different region due to hay sh uh, shortages. Um, if you are getting, you know, a round bale or haylage from a uh, source that, that maybe wasn't uh, handling it appropriately or fermenting it appropriately, then yes, potentially that could increase your risk, but, but beyond that, probably unlikely. Uh, Kay in our live audience wants to know if the type B toxin is exposed to air, does it lose its potency? So the way that it works is once the, once the toxin is created, then it um, then it can cause the disease if it ends up in the horse. So, um, you know, if it ends up in the, uh, if the horse ends up ingesting the toxin, then it can end up in the intestines and then it gets absorbed through the intestines into the bloodstream and then it goes to the nerves and, and causes the, the problem. Um, so, yes, exposing the hay to air, if the toxin hasn't been produced, then that, that would help. But if the toxin has already been produced, then, then unfortunately it's almost too late. So do you, from our conversation tonight, do you have any points that you think are the, the most important for our audience to understand about botulism and treatment and protecting their horses? Yeah, the, I think the, the big take home would be that botulism is, is highly preventable with vaccinations. So if you're worried about botulism, you should talk to your farm vet. Um, and basically they'll know if you're in an area that has a high risk of botulism. Um, and then, you know, if, if you are in an area that has a high risk, you, you really should be vaccinating your horses and you should be staying on top of your vaccinations because there's nothing more um, heartbreaking, you know, disease, you know, almost completely preventable. Okay. Okay. Well, um, Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for tonight. I want to thank Dr. Ludi for joining us and also thank Neogen for sponsoring and bringing you this event uh, for free. Dr. Luthi, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Have a good night. And also, I want to thank everyone who listened live and everyone who submitted questions both before, during registration and during the live event. I hope you can join us next month for Ask the Horse Live when we're going to be talking about biosecurity uh, on the farm, uh, at, in the breeding shed, and at shows and clinics. Until then, from all of us here at the horse, have a great night.